Praise God. Hey, I am excited to be here tonight. It's a little bit different setting than in the youth room because I don't have to worry about you guys like throwing candy back at me or just yelling my name at random times. But I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm not BJ. I'm a shorter, not as good looking version without a beard. But BJ is coming back. I don't know if you guys are excited about that, but I am um, thoroughly excited. He's truly been missed. Um, teaching. He's been missed around the office, just being able to run by and say hello, but he is headed back. They should be back, I'm thinking, soon. So just an awesome thing. I don't know about you guys, but like I said, excited to hear BJ and excited just to hear um, what he brings when he comes back. So he's not here tonight. So we aren't going to be in the book of Ruth, but we are going to be in the book of Exodus. If you'd like to flip to Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14. Why did I choose Exodus? We're going through Exodus on Sunday nights or on Wednesday nights. Um, because Exodus, I've loved the book of Exodus since my first year in Bible college. We had a class um, through the book of Exodus, and it changed my whole view really on the Old Testament, as well as just the book of Exodus. After we went through it, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And I couldn't get enough of the book of Exodus. And then the other day, chapter 14 kept coming up and coming up, and coming up, and I was like, man, I don't know why, and then when BJ asked me to teach, I was like, Exodus 14, that's what it is, and so I'm excited to be in that with you tonight, that's Exodus chapter 14, and we are going to talk about following God's plan, following God's plan for our life, Exodus chapter 14, before we jump into it, a quick story, if you don't know, I grew up in Idaho, I grew up in a small town of Hagerman, Idaho, there's 800 people when I grew up there, but my parents just informed me there is now 600, so the four of our family left, and 196 people left or died, so now there's only 600 in that town, so pray, pray for our old town, because if five years, 200 people left, a couple more years, it's going to be extinct, so we need to pray for Hagerman in revival of life, and revival in the church in Hagerman, but no, I'm excited to be here, but with a small town comes a community family, really, everybody knows everyone, everybody supports everyone, and so lots of memories growing up in Hagerman, and growing up with all the kids in the community, older, younger, and I remember one very, very, very fond memory of going to a basketball game, and I was probably about sixth grade, and we sat right behind our home team, the Hagerman Pirates. We were sitting behind their bench, and there was a close game throughout the whole game, and it was about four, four or five seconds left, and our team was down like two points. So the coach calls a timeout. Coach Cato, he was a coach when I was in sixth grade as well as when I was a freshman and sophomore. He was my basketball coach, and he drew up this play that would have won the Super Bowl, right? He drew up a play that was perfect. He drew up a play that was going to get him the points to win the game. And he took 60 seconds, he took 60 seconds to draw this play for only four seconds left of game time. And so he took a lot more time to make the play, even than there was game time, but it was a very, very important, important key time in the game. And so he drew up the play, they break, they break the huddle, everybody goes out, and this one kid, Dylan Brooks, I'll never forget, Dylan Brooks goes out, they run the play, he gets the ball, instead of taking it and passing it to the next person, he shoots it from half court with like three seconds left. And Coach Cato puts his hands in his face like, what are you thinking? He had just taken 60 seconds to drop this play, and this kid shoots a half court shot. One of like the least best shots you could have taken in basketball. You could have taken it in, you could have passed it for somebody else, and this kid catches it, shoots it from half court with time left on the clock. And you would have thought that Coach Cato would have taken that kid by the neck down into the locker room all the way and then, I don't know, whatever else would have happened once they got in the locker room. But he was furious. And I'll never forget it. And then he was my basketball coach. Really the sweetest guy. Had a history major. Was our history teacher. Never really got mad unless he didn't do the last play with four seconds left. So why do I tell you that story? Well, they say open with a story. But I do believe it goes with Exodus chapter 14 and following God's plan. Because I believe sometimes... Maybe not you guys, but I do that. And we're going to see the children of Israel do that tonight. But God takes time. And he says, hey, here's my plan. And he says, here's all the details. And then they take it up and they throw it in the opposite direction. Or they take it up and they run in the opposite direction. Or they take it and they crumple it up and they throw it in the trash. And so tonight I want to share with, yeah, there's fear and there's things that come with following God's plan. But there's also great reward. There's also great power in the name of Jesus. I love the last song that Dylan sang. 
Show us your glory. Show us your power. If we don't believe in the glory, if we don't believe in the power of God, how are we going to believe in the plan of God? So tonight, if you don't believe in the power of God, then Exodus chapter 14, the children of Israel, the parting of the Red Sea, is writing. It's another letter that you could pick up at the bookstore if you do not believe in the power of our God Almighty. And so that's what we're going to talk about is following God's plan for our life. So before we jump into it, if you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your power, God, and we humbly, God, we humbly come before you tonight and just ask, God, just ask that you would show us a little bit more of that glory, a little bit more of that power through your word, God, through the story of the great miracle that happened. God, and we pray that it would change our lives. Lord, it wouldn't be me, but it would be the power of your word, God, that your Bible says is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, God. And I pray that we would see that tonight. I pray that your spirit would be here tonight. God, it would be spirit speaking to spirit, not man to man, flesh to flesh, but spirit to spirit throughout the rest of the night, through prayer, through worship, through your word. God, so we pray for those areas of our life, God, that maybe are uncomfortable to talk about. We pray for those areas of our life, God, that we need encouraged tonight. We pray that you would speak to us exactly where we're at tonight, in the exact spot. God, you know where each heart is at in this place. God, you know where each mind is at in this place. God, and we pray that we would bring them all under your control. We would give it all over to you, God, and just expectant to see a great work tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Exodus chapter 14, if you aren't there, ask your neighbor. There's a table of context in the front. You guys aren't high schoolers, though, so I hope you're all there. Exodus chapter 14, it says in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may turn and camp before Piharath, between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. Before we jump into that, really quick, I shared it last time that I taught on a Wednesday night. If you're ever reading the Bible in a Bible study setting or an out loud setting, and you come across a word that you don't know how to say, you say it really fast, and then it's good. No one knows what you said. You say it really fast, and no one knows, hey, did they pronounce it right? Did they not pronounce it right? Yeah, yeah, that's where they camp. So, a little pointer before we get into the message. But jumping back, God speaking to Moses. Why? Why is God speaking to Moses? Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, it says this. It says, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not, lay, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So, Pharaoh had had enough. They had faced the plagues. They had faced the death of their firstborn. And so Pharaoh said, hey, get these people out of here. The power of their God, we understand, and we don't want them here anymore. They had been in Egypt for 430 years. And Pharaoh finally said, hey, that's enough. Pharaoh said, they're costing us our kids' lives. They're costing us our livestock. They're costing us our water. They're costing us our peace. They're costing us our homes. And so Pharaoh says, no more. I can't take it anymore. And so he sends them away. And what's interesting is God doesn't send them on the shortest path of the least resistance. Why? Because that would be too easy, right? No, because that's where the giants were. And so God knew. God knew if these people that had been in Egypt for 430 years, born and raised there, all they knew was Egypt. If they would have went out of Egypt and seen these giants in this land, they would have been like, nope, we're going back. We're going to be slaves. Forget about that. We're not warriors. We're slaves, so we're going to go back to what we know how to do. And so God sends them out of his grace. He sends them to the place of Migdal and Pihararoth and Baal Zephon. So he sends them there. Well, what do those places mean? Are they just hard names? No, they aren't. But they have a very important meeting. God has placed them in a cul-de-sac around these places. And so the first one, the first one is Pihararoth, or however you want to say that. And that means... In Hebrew, the place of the gorge. And so they have a gorge on one side. Migdal, in Hebrew, means the tower. So they have a tower on the other side. And then they have the Red Sea, this giant body of water. If you don't know what a sea is, a giant body of water. And so they are surrounded not by green pastures and gold mines and all these great things. They are surrounded by perfect points of attack for the enemy. And what we're going to see is the Egyptians are coming against them to attack them. 
And so they are going to begin to question God. God, why did you put us here? God, why did you not take us somewhere else? You've placed us in this cul-de-sac of defeat. And God says, hey, I have a plan. God says, I'm going to do this for my glory. It says in verses 3 through 4, and it says, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I, listen to this, I, God, will gain glory or gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. So God says, hey, don't worry. It's going to look like an impossible situation, but trust me, my glory is going to be shown. I'm going to receive honor through this. He tells Moses this. He tells the children of Israel this, but they're still going to worry. They're still going to have lack of faith in this situation. So it goes on, and it says in verse 5, and it says, Now it was told to the king of, or to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let, the, we have let Israel go from serving us? So Pharaoh says, what were we thinking? Yeah, we lost our firstborn. People were mourning over their kids dying, but we let all of our slaves go. So what's that mean? We have to do all the work now. Who's going to do all the work? Pharaoh's like, I'm not. I don't know if my predecessors are, but I'm not. And so he says, we need to go get these people because we are a growing country and we cannot do that if we do not have slaves. So he's like, we weren't thinking straight. Get ready. Verse 6, he says, so he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Pharaoh was leading this charge to go and get the children of Israel. Verse 7, also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. That word boldness there means rebellion, which is interesting. The children of Israel went out with rebellion. It's like, hey, awesome. They went out of Egypt. They went out of captivity. But we're going to see throughout their time in the wilderness, they continue to rebel. And it's the same for us, I believe. Man, kids that rebel against their parents in high school usually tend to rebel against authority at their workplace after high school, usually tend to rebel against um, law enforcement after high school, and it just happens. It is the snowball effect. And so be careful, I believe, for myself. It was interesting, because it, it says there that they went out in, with boldness, and you think, hey, praise the Lord. They were like, Lord, we trust you, we're going out. But they weren't, they were going out in rebellion, and we're going to see that in a second, an example of that. But they are chasing after them. The Egyptian army is going after them full forces. Josephus wrote that there was probably about 250,000 military coming from Egypt after the children of Israel. And you think, hey, they have nothing with them. They're walking across the desert. So why do you need that many military, 500,000 chariots and 200,000 soldiers just to go after them? Why? Like that seems kind of ridiculous. Remember, the nation of Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. God said, be fruitful and multiply. They were fruitful and multiply. If we were slim on the number, we're talking 2 million people walking across the desert. We aren't talking 2 people or 20 people or a couple families. 2 million Israelites. And that's on the low end. That's if they weren't having more than one or two kids. That's 2 million people walking across the desert. So now... A quarter of a million, 250,000, doesn't seem like that many. But they had one of the most powerful militaries in that time. Egypt was known for their militaries. They were a very growing and very powerful nation. And so they go after them with everything they got. It wasn't like, hey, take a couple guys. It wasn't like, hey, take the second guy in command. Pharaoh said, get my chariot ready because we're going back because we're not doing this slave labor. We are bringing back the nation of Israel. I promise you we're getting to the point that we're going to focus on tonight. Verse 9. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them. That word overtook there means to reach them. So they didn't necessarily take control. They just got to where they were at. And it says they overtook them camping by the sea beside Piharathroth before Baal Zephon. And so they are exactly in the same location that the children of Israel is at. And guess what? The children of Israel recognize that. Verse 10. It says in verse 10 that, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. 
And so the children of Israel look up and they see 250,000 of Pharaoh's army coming after them and they're afraid because they're stuck in this cul-de-sac knowing they're vulnerable, knowing they're not in a good location. And so the first thing, it's kind of weird. I have like three points and then three points that go with those points. So it's like one, two, three, one A, two A, three A. It'll make sense, I promise, at the end. But the first point I want to talk about is that they were afraid. They were fearful. It says that they were very afraid. It wasn't like, oh, Egyptians are coming for us. It was like, oh my gosh, we are going to die. We've just walked across the desert in this miserable situation just to die, just to lose our lives. And so the first point I want to say is they were very afraid. I believe something that we are going to see throughout this is they did not. They did not, which we think, or I think, man, they had seen these plagues. They had seen they were being led by the tower of fire, the pillar of fire. They were being led by the cloud during the day. It's like the power of God was in front of them, literally. And you're talking a big cloud, a big pillar of fire to light up two million people. And so they physically saw with their own eyes the power of God. And it's like, man. And they were still afraid. God told them, hey, I'm going to do this, but don't worry. It's going to bring me honor, and you guys are going to get out of it. And they still were afraid. And I was studying this, and I was thinking about that. And I was like, man, how? Like, how? If God put a fire pillar right here in the middle of the sanctuary, I'm pretty sure everyone in here, if they weren't converted, would get converted and be on fire for the Lord. Immediately. There would be no question about that. They wouldn't be like, hey, is that the light effects? Is that No. We would all know and we would walk out of this place professing what we had just seen. And so it's like, how? How is that possible? And I was thinking about that. And the Lord convicted me completely. Because how many times, maybe not a pillar of fire, but how many times in my own life have I seen God's power radically change my life? Radically. Man, if I think back three years ago, I was graduating high school, and I was doing high school stuff, thinking, like, what was I thinking? I wasn't. (laughs) And now, three years later, God has completely, powerfully ripped things out of my life and changed my life. And it's nothing on my own. I tried. I tried doing it on my own. Maybe you've tried, and it doesn't. It doesn't work if we do not realize the power of God. We have to. We have to, we have to, we have to. And I was, so I was convicted about this because I was like, how many times just in my own life? And then there's my family's life. Man, I look out. I look out at my dad. Twice. Twice. Had cancer. First time, hey, it's going to be all right. We're going to take it out. Not a huge deal. Second time, 13% chance of living. How? How can I forget God? How can I forget God in those times that I don't want to be bold? How can I forget times when I'm doubting that, God, you did that? God, you did that. And I was thinking, man, how easily we can forget that. I want to pray. I have a close friend, a very close friend. Um, His mother-in-law is in the hospital, and the doctor said, hey, pray. They said, 50-50 chance. And they said, all you can do is pray. And I was like, man, how quick. This last couple weeks, I think, for me, has been just how quick life is. Here today, gone tomorrow. Life is but a vapor. And so I want to do this. I want to pray because I believe, I don't know about you guys, but I believe in the power of God. I believe in the power of the healing of God. And so I want to pray for my friend, but also I want to pray for you. And if there's anyone, if it's your own life, if it's a family member, and I'm not saying, hey, stand up, you need to shout out their name. No, I'm not even sharing you the name of my friend. But we're just going to pray. God knows. The mighty healer. The all-powerful, the all-knowing God knows exactly who we're praying for, exactly who we're lifting up a hand for. So if you want to, I'm going to pray. If you want to lift up your hand, if you know somebody that just needs the power of God to radically change their life. Lord, God, we love you. Lord, we thank you, God, and we pray. God, we pray that we would trust in this power that we've seen throughout the Bible. God's parting the Red Sea, breaking down the walls of Jericho. God, healing the lame, healing the sick. God, we pray that we would believe that power. God, we pray for our friends, our brothers, our sisters in Christ, God, that are hurting right now, that are sick. God, you know the perfect plan. God, you have a plan for their lives. God, we pray for comfort for the families. We pray if it's your will, God, a perfect, miraculous healing over those people. God, and that you would just comfort them. God, the God of hope, the God of joy, the God of comfort. 
Lord, we believe. God, we believe in your power. God, and we lay it at your feet. God, all those people, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is a powerful God. And none of these points matter. None of them matter if we don't realize that. If we don't realize God is powerful, might as well go get some cookies, go get some coffee, watch the football game, and not listen. Because it doesn't. It doesn't matter if we do not believe in the power of God. So the first thing, they were afraid. Fear. Fear, fear, fear. A very, very common thing. But God's going to tell them, hey, do not be afraid again. He's going to remind them. But interesting, as going into verse 11, it says at the end of verse 10, that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. It's like, hey, praise God. They were afraid, and they cried out to the Lord. Awesome. But we're going to see that was just a short period. That was a short period. And then they're like, nope. Moses, what's going on? We don't know what's happening. And that's in verse 11. And it says, then they said to Moses, that was pretty quick, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why? Have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? They're like, Moses, what are you doing? We just walked all this way. We're in the middle of nowhere. Is there no graves in Egypt? Egypt was known for mummying people. They had graves upon graves upon graves upon graves. And so they're like, Moses, what is this about? And then they begin, to, the second thing is to doubt. Doubt. Doubt comes into our heart. Doubt comes into our lives. Why? Because when we're afraid, we do like the children of Israel. We take our eyes off Jesus and we look at the thing we're afraid of. And when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we lose hope. We begin to doubt. The children of Israel had lost sight of God. They had lost their hope because they had lost sight of God. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not that you may abound in hope by the power of money. That you may abound in hope by the power of family. That you may abound in hope by the power of whatever you're finding your hope in. But in the power of the Holy Spirit is where we find our hope. We have to. Pastor Gerald, an awesome message this morning. Psalms chapter 27. One of my favorite songs. Wait, I say on the Lord. Wait. We can't wait. Man, my flesh doesn't want to wait. If I smell something cooking, I want to eat it. When I go to a restaurant and it's a fast food restaurant, it should be fast. If I go to a restaurant and it takes more than 30 minutes, you begin to wonder what are they doing. We want it. We want it. There's nothing in me that says, hey, I'm going to wait. When God says, hey, here's what's going to happen in your life. It's super horrible, but just wait. Not a big deal. I'm like, no, what's going to happen? Tell me, like, I want to know now. I want to know the answer about my friend's mother-in-law. Is she going to be healed? Is she going to pass away? What's going to happen? I don't want to wait. It's not a human thing to wait, but we can wait when the power of the Holy Spirit says, hey, you have this hope. You can't wait on your own, but you have this hope. We can wait in Christ, in Christ. And then the third thing in verse 12, it says, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. They said, Moses, we told you when we were there, hey, forget about it. We don't want to leave anymore. We'll just keep serving. And you drug us out to this God-forsaken desert, and now we're here, and we're going to die. And it says, going on, for it would have been better, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. I do not, I do not like, man, I wish I could have, I should have done this. Man, if we would have done that, then who cares? It's over. When people say that, I coach elementary PE. So awesome. Coach, I would have listened to you. Yeah, but you didn't. So now you have to face punishment, right? It's lame. That's a lame excuse. Like, God, I would have followed you, but my friends were just so cool. God, I would have followed you, but my parents were just so bad. God, I would have followed you. I don't think, I don't think God's going to say, yeah, you're right. I don't. I don't. Because that's not trusting in the power of God, and that's running back to the third thing. They wanted to run back to the things that they were comfortable in. They wanted to move backwards. They wanted to regress. I don't know where this quote came from. I tried looking for it. I don't even know if it was a quote. I don't even know if I heard it or I just thought it. I don't know. But it is this. We have to be progressing forward as Christians. If we are not, we are regressing. We have to be growing daily. If not, we are regressing. We are going back. 
we are taking steps back. I look at it like the snowball effect, which once again in the desert we don't have. But if you're rolling a snowball up the hill, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you keep going. Like our Christian walk, as we walk up the hill, we begin to get bigger and bigger. But as we stop, if you stop, you can only hold it for so long. And the snowball begins to roll down the hill and begins to break apart and begins to fall apart. In the same way, I wholeheartedly believe in our Christian walk, we should be able to look back, hey, a week back, a month back. God, man, I was a sinner back then and I'm still a sinner today, but the things that you've changed in me are crazy. The things that you've changed in me are mighty and it's only because of your word. It's only because of you. It's only because of your power. A lot of times it's referenced to in the Bible about a race. It's referenced to about an athlete. And for me, sports in high school are awesome, but after high school, it's awesome to watch sports. For my sister, she still has that drive to be like the athlete. And so my sister a couple months ago said, hey, Riley, let's start working out. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, and then I thought, give it a month, she'll quit, right? Now like six months later, she's like, every morning, 5.45, she calls me. One time, two times three times, four times. Finally, I'm like, I don't want to hear the phone anymore. Yes, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Hang up. But she just wants to keep going. And I'm like, I'm done. Like, I don't want to work out. (laughs) Lifting weights, side note, not in my notes. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but lifting weights is one of the most silliest ideas anyone ever came up with. Lift heavy things, put down heavy things. Put more weight on. Lift heavy things, put down heavy things. Put more weight on. It doesn't make any sense. And it's hard. And... And my point, why I'm telling you this, is it's that snowball effect. If you stop lifting weights, your muscles begin to deteriorate. And it's like all that time. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you seen him lately? Yeah, he doesn't look the same. Because he stopped. (laughs) He stopped. He got old. And it's the same way in our Christian walk. If we're lifting heavy weights, and we're lifting heavy weights, and we're like, God, I can't take it anymore. I can't do it anymore. And we set down that weight, and we go over to the bench, and we sit down. (sighs) And we sit there, and then we sit there, and then we sit there, and then we sit there. And if you're like me, then you fall asleep, and you just stay there. (laughs) Our Christian walk that God said, hey, it's a race to keep going, to keep powering through, begins to deteriorate and deteriorate and deteriorate. And then we get to that point, and we look back, and we say, God, man, I look at those pictures, and I was buff spiritually. I was strong. God, these things didn't shake me. And now the littlest thing shakes me because we stop. We cannot stop. We cannot move backwards. We always have to keep moving forward. Maybe that's you here in Yucca Valley. Pastor Gerald talked about it at the newcomer's lunch a little bit today. The God-forsaken desert of Yucca Valley. But did you ever think, man, maybe God brought me to Yucca Valley for a reason. Did you ever think tonight you came in here? I know. Came in here, man, it's not BJ. And you're like, I don't know why I'm here. Could be watching the football game. Did you ever think, not because of me, but did you ever think that God maybe had you in Yucca Valley for a reason? That God stationed you in 29 Palms for a reason? That God brought you here tonight for a reason? Not for me, but for his word. Not for the worship, but for his word. But for time to just sit before the Lord. God says, hey, don't go back. Don't go back to those things. Stay here. Stay here in my presence. Stay with me. I think of Peter, James, and John. They go up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And they're like, we don't want to go back. God, this is awesome. This is glorified. We've seen you. And they're like, we don't want to go back. And Jesus is like, hey, we have to go back down the mountain. There's still work to be done. But, man, that's our hope that we have, to be up in heaven with the Lord one day. And there's no going back. There's no going back. Keep going. Keep going. And so the first, point 1A, the answer to point number one because I don't want you to remember the first things. I want you to remember what God responds through Moses. In verse 13, it says this. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. No more Egyptians. God says, you aren't going to see them anymore. So he says, do not be afraid. Fear comes when we're trusting God's plan. God answers, don't be afraid. He says, stand still. Psalms 27, just to wait, to pause. A lot of the Psalms have the word Selah, and there's different arguments about what it means, but the most that people stand with is just it's a time to pause, it's a time to meditate, and just wait, wait upon the Lord. And so he's saying that here. He says, hey, don't be afraid, and wait. Stand still, wait for me 
to move. And then I love this. He says in verse 13, And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. God says, see the salvation of the Lord. That word salvation there can be defined as the deliverance. See the deliverance that God is going to accomplish today. That's the encouragement Moses gives them. And what's awesome is thousands of years later, we have that same encouragement. God says, don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation. Are we in a cul-de-sac awaiting attack? No. But we have a salvation that God says, when you ask me into your life, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, man, I remember no more. Man, you have that hope. You have that salvation. We have that immediate, not tomorrow morning, but we have that immediate deliverance when we see and when we understand the salvation that God gives us. Man, what a great picture it is. And we have to, we have to have faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, love this verse. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Man, you have problems believing? Study. You have problems trusting? Dig in. You have problems talking to? The Lord practice daily. Read your Bible and pray every day. Man, you're lacking faith? Scripture after scripture after scripture about faith. Put those truths into your life. We have to be reminding ourselves with the truth of God. There's so many things in this world that's putting negative, negative thoughts, negative pictures, negative actions into our mind. If we're just taking all that in and we aren't putting in the faith, the belief, the joy, the hope, the long suffering that God shows us through his word, we're going to crumble. We're going to want to stop. We're going to want to give up. Verse 14, it says this. It says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I love this. The second thing, the answer to their doubt is God is fighting for you. And there's nothing to doubt when God's fighting for us. Nothing. And he's better than the United States Special Forces. He's better than all the special forces of the world combined. He's better than the Egyptian army that was known for their chariots and the design of them. People have drawn pictures even to this day of them because of how immaculate they had made them and they believed to have made them. And God's more powerful than that. He's more powerful than the giants. He's more powerful than anything in our lives. And I love this. The first thing he says, hey, don't be afraid. Stand still. The second thing is, hey, God's fighting for you. And right after that, he says in verse 14, you shall hold your peace. You shall hold your peace. That means just wait quietly. Not like the soccer mom. God, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. I don't want to God says just wait quietly peacefully. Everyone's laughing. You don't do that? <laughs> With your kids? I, mean, I don't have kids, but high schoolers is like, God, how could they do such silly things and cause so many problems at a youth camp? It doesn't even make sense. We're only here three days. God, I pray for their parents because these kids need Jesus. <laughs> right? Three days at a youth camp, and it's like, parents, God bless you guys. But it's true. We begin to, oh, whoa, whoa, ha. Ah. Oh, and we get all worked up, and we get all anxious, and God says, hey, I'm fighting for you. God says, hey, I have a plan. I have a perfect game plan that never fails. It's perfect. It's going to work every time, guaranteed. If you don't believe it, 66 books to read through God's game plan, never failing, never failing us. So God says, wait, and I'm not saying these points like I got them figured out because I don't. I still do what I just did a lot. Still working on it. But God says, hey, I'm fighting for you. And just wait. Not frantically, just quietly waiting. And I believe, why, why, why do you say quietly? Because sometimes it's like, man, there's tears or there's groaning of just, God, I don't understand. But those are fine. And the Bible talks about those. But those times that we just stop and we wait quietly. I've been trying to encourage the youth to just take your Bible, open it up, open up a notebook, and begin to read something, and just read it, and then stop. Man, no one around you, no phone, no nothing, just stop, and see what the Lord wants to speak to you. We can get so busy in this world of so many things, ding, 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 emails, everything going in, where God just says, man, I want to speak to you, I want to show you the plan, which we're going to see in the next verse to Moses, but he was, whoa, and so God, I believe it's important just to wait, 
Just to wait upon the Lord. In verse 15, I believe is where we are, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? God says, Moses, okay, I get it. The children of Israel come to you. They're freaking out. They don't know what to do. And you come back to me crying to me. He says, Moses, chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and he told them in verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. God said, I sent Moses, or I sent Pharaoh after you, Moses. I'm the one who put it on his heart to come and get you. He says, why are you coming back to me crying and freaking out? Why are you doing that? He says, I sent him to come after you. And he says in verse 4, I will gain honor over Pharaoh that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. It happened. God says it's going to happen. And Moses still runs to the Lord. It's like, what an awesome picture. Because how often are we that? Man, we can get a promise or a truth taught to us at church and then walk out of church and not want to wait. Like this morning, speaking about God is there. He's helping us in the times and just to wait. And then you can walk out and you'll not want to wait. And you'll not want to do that. But how awesome it is God says, hey, I mightily use Moses. And he still, he still had to learn daily. He still had to learn daily. So God tells Moses, why do you cry to me? It seems, hey, that's kind of harsh, right? Two million people are asking you why you did a thing. You might cry too, right? If they're coming, why are, you, why are we here? We're going to die. And Moses goes to the Lord and God says this to him. He says, tell the children of Israel to go forward. He says, go forward. And the last thing, when we want to go backwards, God says, go forward. Take one step. And after that one lands, take another step. And after that one lands, take another step. And keep taking one step in front of the next. He doesn't say take giant steps. He doesn't say take leaps. He just says go forward. Keep going. That word go forward there, I love this picture because they're in the wilderness. They're setting up camp, right? That word go forward there means, it's the Hebrew word nasa, and it means to pull up the tent pins. So God specifically tells them, hey, pull up your tent pins. He says it's time to go forward. It's like, man, Moses was crying to the Lord, and then he speaks such a powerful thing to them. If you don't know what happens, they go forward. Moses puts out his rod. The sea parts. They go through the Red Sea. They are saved from the Egyptian army. Not only that, the Egyptian army follows them because God hardens their heart again, and they are covered in the Red Sea. 250,000 or so military chariots, horses, horsemen, archers covered by the Red Sea. Completely wiped out. And God says, hey, I promised you I would do this, that you wouldn't see them again. And he simply had to go forward. I believe, I believe wholeheartedly tonight, as I was preparing, as I was trying to figure out what to teach, man, there's those times of, Lord, what am I supposed to teach? I don't know. And Moses, God, what do I tell these people? God, what do I tell these people? that are older than me, that are smarter than me, that have been doing it longer than me. What do I say? And I believe God says, go forward tonight. Don't be mad at me. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're stopped. I'm not saying it. The Bible says, go forward. The Bible says, pull up those tent pegs. They're in the wilderness of Sinai or the wilderness of Egypt, the desert of Egypt. And God says, hey, pull them out. And follow me. Just like the New Testament. God says, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And tonight, that's my challenge to you. Are you actively, daily saying, God, what's your plan for my life? And then when the fear comes, when the doubt comes, are you saying, God, I understand this isn't of you. I want to move forward. God, help me with this fear. Help me with this doubt. I'm the first one to say daily. Daily, God, help me with this fear. I don't know what to do, but I can trust that you have a plan for my life. Your word promises. Are you tonight going forward? I want to read Psalms. It seems like we've been in Psalms a lot and have been referencing Psalms a lot. Psalms chapter 106, verse 7 through 12, talks about the powerful thing God did in Exodus chapter 14. It says in Psalms 106, 7 through 12, Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled. 
by the sea, the red or by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the sea also, and it dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them, and he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. They believed his words and they sang his praise. I'm going to invite Dylan back up. But such a powerful testimony of Exodus chapter 14, which we studied tonight, is even in their fear, God said, do not be afraid. Even in their doubt, God says, hey, I'm with you. I'm fighting for you. Even in them wanting to return to their old ways, God says, move forward. And I love Psalms in that section and the story of Psalms on that because of this. It said, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They didn't understand it. They didn't remember the multitude of your mercies. Remember, God had done great things. And still, the children of Israel did not remember it. And just like Coach Cato wanted to take Dylan Brooks by the neck back to the dugout, because he didn't remember, he didn't understand, he didn't trust. Man, God isn't like that. When we don't understand, when we do our own things, when we live crippled by fear for a season, God doesn't come to us and grab us by the neck. Like, what were you thinking? God comes and he says, hey, I'm here. Are you ready? Are you ready? Trust me. Are you ready to trust me? Are you ready to follow me? And so I believe that's important to understand the wonders of God, to remember the multitude of his mercies, and to make his mighty power known. That's why God saved the children of Israel. Because we're going to see they rebel against him when they're wandering. But God saved them for his glory. In the same way God desires to set people free today for his glory. So that people can see that witness. People can see that light. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. I'm going to end with this. I promise. Revelation 3 21. I believe it is. If you would like to flip there. Verse 20, we're going to start in verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. Verse 21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, or he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God says, if anyone, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him. And I love this. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. If you're here tonight and you're like, man, all I want to do is go back. All I want to do is go back to my old ways. All I want to do is run back to those things that are comfortable. God says, hey, that's not for me. I want you to overcome. I want you to be overcomers. God desires that for us. And even as Christians, we can get in those plateaus of rolling the ball up the hill, and we're like, hey, arrest. And God says, I want you to stop. I want you to overcome this one, and I want you to keep going. And so tonight, my challenge is this. If you've never accepted the Lord, God says, hey, I stand at the door and knock. If you've never accepted it, he says, hey, I want you to be an overcomer. So tonight, if that's you, man, my challenge to you is why? What's holding you from opening up the door? Is it fear? Is it doubt? Is it wanting to go back to those old ways? Because God says, hey, don't be afraid. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm fighting for you. Don't doubt. He says, go forward, not backwards. So if that's you, and there's going to be people on the sides to pray. But then my second thing, and I believe more people in here, is believers. Man, very clear. It says, he did that so we could overcome. God doesn't. God doesn't want us to struggle. We were studying with the high schoolers, Romans chapter 6, that sin has no power over believers. Do you believe that? God says, hey, we can't be focused on that. We can't be running back to that. We have to be focused looking forward. And so my challenge to you, believers, is if tonight you're like the children of Israel, stuck, maybe crippled by fear or doubt, it's a real thing, 100%. 100% crippling if you're like I'm done I want to overcome this God says 
open the door. God says, come back to me. God says, I'm here. God says, I want you to be an overcomer. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, it says in Romans. And God says, I desire that. That's why I sent my son. Not so that you could live in condemnation. John 3, 7, John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The enemy wants you to walk out of here like, man, how are you even sitting in that building? If only they knew. And God said, that's not me. God says, I'm glad you're here tonight. Is there a reason I had you here tonight? If anyone has an ear to hear, let them hear. God wants to do a mighty work in our lives. What do we want to say? Let's go. I'm ready for this plan. Whatever it is, wherever you lead me, wherever you take me, I will follow. anybody else fear? Anybody else doubt? Does anybody else ever just want to go back? Just run back? Just pull the covers over your head? Go back? God, this was easier before. God says our hope is in our salvation. Eternity deliverance. So here's my challenge. Tonight, if you are afraid of anything, if you're doubting something what's holding you back from going forward what's holding you back from taking that first step that says God I don't want to do this anymore here's my challenge in a group in a room full of people that want to support you you want we stand and say God here it is I don't want to be crippled by this anymore I want to be an overcomer will you stand tonight because if you are crippled by fear or doubt, here's what you're thinking. Oh, no, it's too scary. Oh, what are people going to think around me? You're having fear and doubt. And the enemy wants you to have that. The enemy wants you to walk out and be like, oh, I didn't stand up. Whew. Whew. And then he's going to attack you with more fear and more doubt. God says, hey, stand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is powerful. God is a mighty God. God is a healer. God is a conqueror. And we thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, God, we thank you for your power. God, your word says not by might. God, not by, um, God, not by might nor by strength, but by your power, God. It's not by man. It's not by me. It's not by anybody else. But it's by your word, God. It's by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I think of the disciples. God, you sent them out with nothing. The staff and a cloak. God, and they did a powerful work. God, lives were changed, lives were transformed, Lord, and it was because they understood the power of you, God. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters that are standing tonight, God, that you would bind the enemy. God, because even though the enemy knows those things and the enemy does have some power on this planet, God, it's nothing compared to your power, God, and your glory. God, you are in complete control of that. Lord, so I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for my own life. God, as I stand, God, and I say, Lord, I give it to you, the fears, the anxieties, the doubts, whatever they are, and God, I say, here you go, God. I pray that we would just walk out of here one step in front of the next, and we would just keep doing that. And when it gets tough, we would keep taking steps. God, and we would dig into all we have, and we would keep taking steps knowing that, God, you're going to bless us with that, and one day, God, one day we're going to see those loved ones, God, that have passed away. One day we're going to sit God, in your glory, in your power. And like it says at the end, God, we're just going to worship. Lord, and so that's my prayer tonight is we would walk out of here, God, free. God, these chains, we wouldn't run back to them even when we want to. But we would know, God, you've broken them. You've thrown them away. You've cast them down, God, and that we are a new creation, God. The old man has passed away. Behold, we are new creations tonight, God, not because of us, but because of you, God, and your word. Lord, I thank you for the boldness. God, I pray that for those around them, God, that we would all walk out in boldness. We'd be uplifting to one another. In Jesus' name.